Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, The Gut Microbiome in Myalgic Encephalomyelitis Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, a Neuroimmune Disease presented by Maureen Hansen. We are excited to bring you this educational web seminar presented and sponsored by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. I'm Christina Jewell of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We will be pushing out a few polls. These polls, polls are anonymous and we encourage you to respond. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing this presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located at the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window, or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continue, continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located at the bottom left-hand corner of your web page and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Now I'd like to introduce Maureen Hansen. Maureen R. Hansen is Liberty High Bailey Professor in the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. She received a BS degree at Duke University and a PhD in Cell and Developmental Biology from Harvard University. After completing an NIH and RSA postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard, she joined the faculty of the biology department at University of Virginia before moving to Cornell. She presently has a diverse research program involving gene expression and intracellular organelles in plants and humans. She has a special interest in the pathophysiology of myalgic encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome. I will now pre turn this presentation over to Maureen. It appears we may be having some technical difficulties connecting with Ms. Hansen. Do you mind holding just one moment while we figure out these technicalities? We're having a webcam issue. Just one moment. We'll be switching right over to her. Thanks for your patience. Hello, can you hear me now? Okay, I'm going to now begin my talk about the gut microbiome in myalgic encephalomyelitis, also known as chronic fatigue syndrome, which is a neuroimmune disease. More information is uh, available from uh, my lab website, which is uh, which is uh, shown on this uh, first slide. I'm going to give you an outline of my talk. I'm going to have a first part of my talk is uh, first part of my talk is going to be a description of the disease that's known as MECFS. I'm going to start with the definition that was uh, utilized in 1994 and a more recent definition uh, in 2015, the di new diagnostic criteria. Uh, I'm also going to describe a little bit about post-exertional malaise, which is the hallmark sy symptom of this disease, and 
uh, also give you a brief summary of immunological findings as this is also a immunology uh, conference. Then I'm going to go into our study of the gut microbiome and uh, the uh, MECFS. So I want to start first with describing what this disease is. Without knowing something about the disease, it's really not easy to interpret the information about the uh, microbiome that I'll be presenting later. Uh, myalgic means pain or tenderness in one or more muscles. And encephalomyelitis means infl inflammation of the brain and spinal cord, typically due to acute viral infection. One problem with this name that concerns medical professionals is that in most cases, we don't have good evidence that there is actually inflammation of the brain and spinal cord in most of the patients who present with the disease. Therefore, in 1988, the Center for Disease Control decided to, uh, decided to uh, change this name uh, of the disease to chronic fatigue syndrome, uh, published in the paper that I show here. Now, uh, one problem about this name, chronic fatigue syndrome, is it really uh, results in uh, people not understanding the seriousness of the disease. Okay, so the 1994 CDC definition for chronic fatigue syndrome required unexplained persistent or relapsing fatigue that's of new or definite onset and a substantial reduction in previous level of activities. But in addition, there had to be at least four of these symptoms lasting at least six months. Difficulties with memory, problems with sleep, muscle pain, headaches, tender lymph no nodes, increased malaise following exertion, sore throat, and joint pain. One issue about this definition is that the presence of other diseases excluded the diagnosis of chronic fatigue syndrome. The problem with that is that you could, for example, get cancer after you had chronic fatigue syndrome, and theoretically, you would no longer have chronic fatigue syndrome. But obviously, that's not the case. Now, a lot of the uh, patients are not pleased with the name chronic fatigue syndrome because it does trivialize the illness and results in people not realizing how serious it is. This is a sampling of images that were used to illustrate our recent microbiome article, the article that I'm going to be talking about uh, that concerns the gut microbiome in MECFS. These images appeared in online and print news media showing people who simply look tired. These people probably do not have muscle pain, problems with, uh, with uh, their joints and other aspects that have nothing to do with fatigue. As a result of this, uh, in 2013, the Department of Health and Human Services in the US contracted with the Institute of Medicine, that's the National Academy of Medicine, to convene a committee of experts to recommend new diagnostic criteria for MECFS. This resulted in the production of this book uh, here that, um, uh, that is, can be ordered and downloaded uh, at no cost from their website. Uh, and this book uh, really uh, describes a lot of the literature. The, the committee reviewed the literature to uh, uh, determine what was really established and what was not established. One thing that the uh, book has as key facts is that the estimates of U.S. prevalence are, uh, range from anywhere from 836,000 to 2.5 million. The true number is really not known. There haven't been adequate epidemiological studies. And this is uh, compounded by the fact that many people with MECFS have not yet been diagnosed. There are more women than men with MECFS, estimates perhaps 2 to 1 maybe even three to one ratio. And the average age of onset is around 33, but there's quite a range. People can get this disease before the age of 10 and after the age of 70. The Institute of Medicine recommended some new clinical criteria for this uh, disease. The idea was to have diagnostic criteria that would allow any type of physician, whether they are 
pediatricians, general practitioners, or specialists to be able to identify and diagnose this disease. What's required, again, is a substantial reduction in activity for more than six months. And this is a reduction in the ab uh, uh, ability to engage in what the individuals were able to do before, either occupational, educational, social, or personal. And it's of new or definite onset. It's not something that has occurred lifelong. And it's not alleviated by rest. The other two requirements are post-exertional malaise, which I'll be describing in a few minutes, and unrefreshing sleep. A fourth requirement is that the individuals must have either cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. In other words, uh, the uh, problems with remaining upright and, um, uh, uh, and uh, with their uh, blood pressure uh, autonomic nervous system control. A new name was proposed, Systemic Exertion Intolerance Disease, for the disease previously known as ME or CFS. This name has not yet caught on with the patient community, and it is also not used very much in the literature yet. So I'll be referring to this disease as ME-CFS throughout my talk. That is currently the preferred name by most of the patient organizations. Because post-exertional malaise is a very important symptom in this disease, in fact, it even resulted in the new name being exertion intolerance, uh, I want to describe that a bit further. This is an exacerbation of a patient's ME-CFS symptoms following exertion that would have been easily tolerated prior to their illness. The exacerbation typically occurs within 24 hours, but it can last a few days to even months. And what happens with most patients is they often reach a steady state of exertion that they can tolerate before inducing this post-exertional malaise. Now, for some people, this is they can work part-time, but if they try to, say, one day work full-time a whole day, they're unable uh, uh, to uh, rebound the next day. They're often ill from that extra exertion. For other patients, the ones who are so-called housebound patients, if they do as much of going out to the grocery store to shop, they will then be sick, potentially in bed for the next few days. And the people who have severe cases of this disease, just simply getting up to go brush their teeth can make them sick for the rest of the day. Uh, in bed, uh, unable to function. Post-exertional malaise is a symptom that can be objectively measured by two successive cardiopulmonary exercise tests, so-called CPETs. Uh, this um, uh, shows an example of a CPET in which the person is exercising on a bicycle, and it's possible to measure the maximum heart rate, oxygen consumption, the ventilatory threshold, the maximum workload, and the respiratory exchange ratio. An RER of greater than 1.1 indicates that participants are performing work at maximal levels. The RER uh, indicates the ratio of carbon dioxide ex exhaled and oxygen consumed. So what happens to ME-CFS patients after an exercise challenge? It's now been reported in four different papers, this is reproducible, that when ME-CFS patients perform a second CPET at, and uh, after they've induced post-exertional malaise by their initial CPET, their CPET values are usually not reproduced despite an RER of one greater than 1.1 indicating maximal effort. The frequent findings in the second CPET are either lower maximum oxygen consumption, lower anaerobic threshold, or failure to produce maximum heart rate, failure to increase uh, the uh, blood pressure, or multiple abnormalities. Some patients have multiple uh, problems with, these, uh, with the second CPET. In fact, uh, one, of the, uh, one of my colleagues who has tested people uh, uh, by two successive CPETs has commented that sometimes when the person comes in who is severely ill, on the second day when they're going to do their CPET, when they first get on the bike, before they've done any exercise, they are already using their anaerobic metabolism, really indicating that these patients have post-exertional malaise. Now, in contrast to ME-CFS patients, patients with other diseases, including heart fail, failure or lung diseases, are able to reproduce 
their CPET results. So this is really a unique finding in this disease. It's very useful for diagnosis. Of course, uh, uh, having to have patients do two successive CPETs is um, uh, not something one wants to do uh, routinely, and that's why the new diagnostic criteria by the IOM will be very useful. Uh, one thing that should be noted is that NECFS patients are frequently encouraged to start exercise programs because exercise often is beneficial for various diseases, but in this case, such programs can induce post-exertional malaise and can often cause long-term increases in symptoms. It, this is not to say that no exercise is useful. It just must be very carefully monitored and uh, it needs to be done at a level that's not going to induce post-exertional malaise. The biological basis for this phenomenon is unknown and I believe personally that it's going to be very important to understand what's happening uh, when people uh, have this post-exertional malaise induced, it might give us really insight, real insights into the uh, problem uh, in this disease. Now, a number of symptoms implicate immune activation in NECFS. There are a number of inflammatory symptoms like sore throat, muscle pain, swollen lymph nodes, joint pain, flu-like feeling, newer worsened sensitivity and altered susceptibility to infection. So I want to briefly discuss immune relationships, immune system or relationships in this disease. There have been quite a number of reports uh, that there are abnormalities in leukocyte function in NECFS. This just shows a collection of some of the titles of some of the papers uh, of uh, concerning abnormal leukocyte function. This has been known for quite a long time. In fact, one of these papers I have here uh, is a report from 1994 in which uh, uh, the in investigators uh, documented abnormal natural killer cell function in the patients with MECFS. So with regard to these research reports concerning altered immune function, one reproducible finding is that there is reduced activity of natural killer cells. This has been re reproduced in several different laboratories. Another finding that seems to be uh, reproducible is an altered function of the RNA-L pathway. Other, uh, as other findings that implicate some uh, uh, alteration in immune function is that in a subset of patients treated with rituximab, which is a B cell depleting agent, there was marked improvement. This is in a subset of patients, not all patients. In another subset of patients, uh, they were also able to have marked improvement when they were treated with antivirals active against herpes viruses. There have been a number of reports also of abnormal levels of plasma cytokines, altered abundance of lymphocyte subsets, and abnormal T cell responses. Unfortunately, of the many reports, there's a lot of inconsistency, and so we really don't know what's, ex what's happening uh, in, in uh, this uh, de definitively, uh, but I do think there's enough smoke that there's probably some fire, and if we knew how to do the uh, assays uh, consistently, uh, we, we might be able to uh, get consistent data on uh, these last three factors. I'd like to also mention that there have been outbreaks of MECFS, and of course outbreaks implicate an infectious agent. One of the first outbreaks was in 1934, a well-documented outbreak at the Los Angeles County Hospital. Since then, there have been a number of outbreaks in hospitals or in uh, groups of people that are confined in a small location, for example, on military bases, bases in an orchestra, and also in two small towns, two of the most famous outbreaks are in Incline Village, Nevada in 84, and in Lindenville, New York in 85. There seems to have been an increase in the uh, frequency of outbreaks and clusters in the 1980s. Now, one peculiar aspect is that since in the last 20 years, we have not had an outbreak in the U.S. that's been reported of this disease that involving hundreds of people. The outbreaks in Incline Village and in Lindenville, for example, uh, were hundreds of people, several hundreds of people became ill uh, with this disease at that time. 
why we're not seeing those outbreaks uh, now is not understood. Whether there's been some change in virulence of a pathogen, whether there's change in the resistance of the population to some pathogen, or whether we're simply missing some of those uh, outbreaks is not really known, though I do think if there were an outbreak in a small town of several hundred people, that would certainly be noticed. Uh, there are, however, uh, plenty of cases, sporadic cases arising, and there's a lot of anecdotal evidence indicating that the uh, uh, prevalence of this disease has been increasing since the 90, 1980s and is continuing to increase. But there is not yet good epidemiology to document uh, exactly this change in prevalence. The SF36 questionnaire is often used to characterize ME-CFS patients and victims of other types of diseases. The patients figure, uh, fill out a survey indicating some things like whether they can carry groceries, climb stairs, uh, how much work they can do, how much pain they have. They also fill out questions about their mental health and their mental uh, uh, psychological functioning. I, this is an interesting paper that appeared in 19, this is data from an interesting paper that appeared in 1996 that has been graphed without the standard deviations in order to make it easier to view. Uh, a number of other papers have documented this same finding and that is that MECFS patients have less quality of life than individuals with such uh, known uh, in, important diseases as multiple sclerosis, congestive heart failures. If we look here, uh, this, this is the, um, this is the uh, uh, curve for the uh, people with uh, MECFS. You can see their scores on the SF36 are lower than uh, the scores uh, of the uh, healthy individuals up here. And uh, these scores are uh, also lower than people with such diseases as high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, diabetes, uh, uh, heart attack, the, and multiple sclerosis. The one place where the people with uh, chronic fatigue syndrome in this study uh, had better scores were in the mental health and the emotional role scores. Here, they have higher scores than individuals with depression. So uh, while they have worse uh, physical scores, they uh, have uh, relatively um, uh, good uh, uh, mental health and emotional role scores relative to individuals with depression. I'd now like to turn to my talk about the microbiome and MECFS with that background. Uh, this study has been published in the journal Microbiome. It was a collaboration between my lab and the lab of Ruth Lay uh, in my department. Uh, the uh, collaborators, the lead author on the paper is a postdoctoral associate in my lab, Lud Ludovic Gilito. Uh, Julia Goodrich and Tony Walters worked in Ruth Lay's lab. Susan Levine uh, is the, our collaborating physician. Uh, let me just remark that the, with regard to the human microbiota, it's now thought that there's as many micro microbial cells as human cells in or on our bodies, but most of these are in the large intestine and they are known to provide enhanced nutrition and protection against pathogen, but can also have other effects on our body. The human micro microbiome is known to be associated with disease. Uh, for example, it's known to be associated with obesity, uh, with diabetes, and uh, with Crohn's disease. But one issue with regard to these diseases, as well as with MECFS, are these differences a cause of the disease or a consequence? There are a number of factors that are associated with composition of the gut microbiota. There's diet, there's a health status, there's genotype, and there's also age. Now, many uh, MECFS patients complain of gastrointestinal symptoms. Gastrointestinal symptoms uh, are not required for either this 1994 CDC definition of MECFS or for the new IOM uh, definition. Nevertheless, many patients, the majority of patients, complain they have some sort of gastrointestinal problem. 
So the question arises whether this abnormal gastrointestinal function is causing infl inflammation and therefore perhaps some of the other symptoms, and also whether the gut microbiome of ME-CFS patients differs from he healthy controls. So our study population uh, was uh, provided by Dr. Susan Levine from Manhattan, New York. She has a number of um, ME-CFS patients, and she recruited the patients in the controls. She drew blood and sent the blood to us and uh, also gave stool sampling kits to the patients uh, and the controls. So there were uh, 39 controls and uh, uh, for, uh, 49 patients. Of these patients, uh, 25 of them uh, reported a sudden onset of the disease. Often a patient can tell you exactly what day they became ill, and, the, and often it's after a flu-like illness. The age of the controls in the patients, uh, the median was uh, close, as well as the body mass index, but you can see in both cases there's quite an age range of the patients and controls that, that uh, were subjects, and, and a quite a range also in the body mass index of both. With regard to intestinal discomfort, eight of, eight of the 39 controls and 32 of the of 47 patients who reported information indicated that they had some sort of intestinal discomfort, whether this was frequent uh, diarrhea, constipation, uh, other uh, uh, pain, uh, all that, that's a fairly high and expected uh, complaint of intestinal discomfort among the patients. The SF36 profiles of the ME-CFS patients in our study were very similar to those in pre prior studies of ME-CFS. The black bar here shows the uh, our studies, uh, ME-CFS uh, scores, and again, the, uh, the scores on physical functioning were, uh, were uh, pretty high, uh, I mean, uh, pretty similar, not high, pretty similar to the uh, other, uh, other scores. What was higher was the uh, um, um, role, uh, emotional health and, and, uh, and uh, mental health, that these scores were quite good uh, uh, relative to uh, controls, but the, phys the vitality in particular was quite uh, low in comparison to uh, what you'd expect for healthy individuals. So there are some inflammatory markers in plasma that are possibly related to intestinal function, and we wanted to assay all of these markers. Uh, there's lipopolysaccharide, LPS, which is a component of the outer membrane of gram-negative bacteria. There's LBP, which is a human protein that binds to LPS. There's a receptor, a soluble CD14, it detects the presence of LPS bound to LBP. And then there is uh, FABP, which is an intestinal fatty acid binding protein, which can sometimes be a marker of intestinal damage. So uh, just to remind you that gram-negative bacteria have lipopolysaccharides on their surface. And it's thought that in a case of a dysfunctional gut, sometimes bacteria can go through the, uh, the gut uh, if, if the cells are, are not functioning properly and enter the bloodstream and then uh, result in an increased amount of LPS in the bloodstream, which then can induce inflammation. So we carried out assays of LPS and FABP. The graph here shows the amount on the y-axis and whether it's controls or ME-CFS patients. Each one of these dots here uh, is an individual measurement of an individual uh, subject. You can see that the controls had less LPS on average than the uh, ME-CFS patients. However, there were some controls in patients who had approximately the same amount of LPS. So it's not entirely discriminatory for uh, patients versus controls. In the case of, of FABP, we didn't see any significant difference between the ME-CFS patients and the controls. However, we were able to see uh, that there's evidence for direct stimulation by LPS in vivo 
and that is the levels of LBP in the NECFS patients are considerably higher uh, than those of the uh, uh, controls, uh, indicating, uh, again, that there's LPS stimulation. The receptor that detects the LPS bound to LBP is also considerably higher in the MECFS patients. So there's definitely some indication of uh, LPS stimulation. This data implies ongoing damage to the gut, leading to increased microbial translocation. Now, uh, there are some other diseases which also have increased uh, LPS, and, uh, uh, and that these are fatty liver disease, HIV infection, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. So with this information, it seemed worthwhile to uh, uh, go on and also analyze the uh, gut microbiome in these patients and controls. This is how we analyze the gut microbiome, bacterial uh, microbiomes. Uh, fecal samples were collected, preserved in a preservative, and shipped by the subjects themselves, and then processed at Cornell. The DNA was isolated from these fecal samples, and then 16S ribosomal uh, RNA gene PCR was performed, uh, uh, and then the uh, individual patients uh, sequences were obtained on an alumina myseq, uh, and we obtained as many as 140,000 sequences per sample. I'd like to briefly comment about how we classified the microbiota. We used operational taxonomic units instead of species because uh, we cannot know exactly whether some of the uh, uh, sequences we found represented different species or were simply uh, similar. So we used a cutoff of 97%, which is typically used to identify an operational taxonomic unit. Uh, so if, if two sequences were 97% similar, then they were considered to be the same species. We then looked to see, uh, in this case, we've got uh, uh, this little example here. There's uh, three uh, different OTUs. In these, uh, in, in these that are assayed in these three individuals. So the pink individual has more uh, of OTU A, the blue has less, and the green has none. And that kind of data is what we use to develop a matrix uh, of similarity of the individual's microbiomes. So uh, in this case, the uh, blue and the, the uh, the blue and the uh, uh, pink uh, individuals had uh, 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 more similarity than the, uh, the pink and the green individual here. So when we graph this on a uh, principal component uh, graph, we can see that these, the blue and the green microbiome, this is representing the, the entire microbiome of the blue person, the green person, are more similar than the one, uh, the person who's diagrammed as pink in this example. Now, of course, we didn't use just three OTUs. Actually, to make such a graph, we had to use a thousands of OTUs for each subject. Now, when that was done, we, uh, and we looked at the bacterial diversity, again, how similar are the entire microbiomes of the patients and controls? We were not able to distinguish the CFS uh, patients and the controls by this analysis. This is not ex unexpected because this type of analysis is not adequate to distinguish the uh, microbiomes of other people with other uh, gut microbiome related diseases. So for example, here is a paper about uh, pediatric Crohn's disease in which they had a much larger cohort and analyzed in the same way. And you can see here that the red and green uh, dots are very uh, close together, there's really no separation uh, able to be done in these patients with pediatric Crohn's disease versus healthy patients. So this is not a fine enough analysis. We had to use a different type of analysis to see if we could determine some uh, differences between the patients and controls. So uh, one thing that we uh, performed was to examine, uh, one experiment we performed was to examine whether bacterial diversity within the MECFS patient cohort and the healthy cohort differed 
On the y-axis is phylogenetic diversity. How many species are of uh, OTUs do we are we finding in the uh, patients versus controls? As the number of sequences uh, seek, uh, obtained per sample increases, this is called a rarefaction analysis, we can see that the uh, patients and controls differ in their amount of uh, uh, species detected. If you look very early and you don't have very many sequences, you wouldn't see this difference between the patients and controls. It's necessary to obtain enough sequences that uh, one can then begin to see that there is, in fact, a loss of species richness in MECFS microbiomes. I'd like to mention that after this paper was published, a microbiologist at Liberty University, Alan Gillen, contacted me and asked, have you compared the uh, microbiomes of the individuals who reported gastrointestinal disturbance versus the patients who did not report gastrointestinal disturbance? And we'd actually not done that analysis, so Tony Walters and Ruth Lay's lab kindly checked on this, and he found indeed that the people who reported gastrointestinal discomfort had less diversity than the patients who uh, did not report the gastrointestinal uh, disturbances. So this is an additional piece of information indicating this abnormality could be important. We also discovered that we had 24 families in genera that were differentially abundant between MECFS patients and he healthy individuals. This, the, the, these differences are statistically significant. So on, on this diagram here, in this red box, are all of the uh, groups, taxonomic groups, that are less abundant in the patients than in the controls. Some of these ones that are back, uh, OTUs and species and uh, uh, families in genera are actually ones that are known to be beneficial. For example, members of the ruminococcaceae were significantly higher uh, in healthy individuals than in MECFS patients. Uh, some members of the ruminococcaceae are known to produce an anti-inflammatory protein. They're also known to produce butyrate, which is an anti-inflammatory fatty acid. Lower levels of these butyrate-producing bacteria and butyrate itself are also seen in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. We then uh, investigated whether we could uh, use the data to make a test for disease status, whether we could identify patients versus controls using a combination of the levels of LPS, LBP, and S, uh, soluble CD14 in the blood with the microbiome composition. In, the, uh, in our patient cohort, 55% were diagnosed by the MD as having MECFS and 45% were healthy. In the case of the MECFS, we were actually able to identify 53% of that 55% as MECFS. Unfortunately, however, we also identified 12% of the normal individuals as having MECFS according to this test. Nevertheless, we were able to identify correctly 30% of the normal individuals. What this means is that we were actually able to identify correctly 83% of the cohort as having either MECFS or not, uh, merely from three blood levels of these inflammatory proteins and the microbiome composition. So this is very promising and certainly indicates that there is a biological disruption in the microbiome composition in MECFS with some additional markers that may be possible to use this kind of data to uh, distinguish patients uh, and controls. There are some limitations to bacterial microbiome analyses, however. The data is inadequate to uh, reveal whether or not a particular bacterial strain is differentially present in patients versus healthy individuals. For example, some of the patients could uh, have a bad type of bacterium, a, a variant, a, a strain of a bacterium that we are only able to identify that it belongs to a certain species, but we don't know if that's a bad strain. 
An example is E. coli. We would know whether E. coli is present in uh, patient's uh, gut microbiome, but if it is the uh, uh, pathogenic type of E. coli that has caused outbreaks of E. coli-related disease, we would not see that from this type of analysis. Other type of analyses would be needed to identify whether uh, there is uh, uh, any of that bad E. coli present. These bacterial microbiome studies also don't reveal what eukaryotic pathogens or beneficial species might be present, such as yeast and parasites. We are continuing on to analyze our data uh, using 18S uh, uh, sequencing to uh, study uh, what, what types of eukaryotic um, species may be present. Uh, we, this data also doesn't indicate whether viruses are differentially present, and that is another type of analysis that we are currently uh, carrying out. In conclusion, I have shown you that there is less bacterial diversity in patients compared to healthy populations. Uh, there's an association of abundance of particular bacterial groups with MECFS or with healthy status. 83% of the samples can be correctly classified and anti-inflammatory bacterial species are reduced in MECFS patients. I'd like to end by just describing briefly a case report that is now in press that was done in collaboration with Betsy Keller, an exercise physiologist at Ithaca College. Uh, she had uh, two uh, identical twins come to her uh, for uh, exercise uh, testing for CPETs. And uh, we thought this was an opportunity to examine the gut microbiome of two individuals whose genotype is quite similar. Uh, these were two male uh, twins, age 34. One of them uh, was, had MECFS for three and a half years at the time of testing, while the other one was well. In the first CPAT, the ill twin had lower maximum oxygen consumption than the well twin. This indicates that, as you might expect, the ill twin was less physically fit than the well twin, uh, likely not having been able to do uh, much exercise in the last three and a half years. But what was interesting and relevant to what I described earlier about exertion intolerance, the ill twin did not reproduce his results in the first test when he did it the second time after inducing post-exertional malaise. The ill twin reached anaerobic threshold at 13% lower oxygen consumption. Uh, uh, so uh, this, again, is that abnormality of post-exertional malaise that's required for the diagnosis of uh, MECFS in the new definition. The ill twin had reduced gut microbiome diversity, very similar to what we found uh, when we were examining the larger cohort. And uh, on the uh, graph on the right, what you're seeing in these bar graphs is each color represents a different bacterial group. And you can also see that despite having very similar genotype, as you would expect for identical twins, there's quite a difference in their ba bacterial uh, microbiome composition, uh, also s similar to the larger study. So uh, there is some additional information about the, uh, our uh, MECFS uh, microbiome study available on a, a webinar that I gave last week. This is a patient-focused webinar uh, in contrast to this one, which is really researcher and uh, medical professional focused. I also gave a patient-focused presentation at the M Invest in ME conference in London uh, in June. And it's possible to get a DVD of that entire conference at the uh, website indicated below. Uh, we will also be presenting some additional information about the gut microbiome uh, at uh, the upcoming IACFS ME conference. The, uh, this is the uh, major uh, scientific conference uh, held on uh, this disease, and it will be in uh, Fort Lauderdale in October. And, uh, the lead author on the bacterial microbiome uh, study will give some new information about the viral microbiome, and uh, graduate student Alexandra Mandarano will give uh, a, a poster about eukaryotes in the MECFS gut microbiome. And thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Maureen, for that informative presentation. Now it's time for Q&A. If you have a question you'd like to ask Ms. Hansen, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on your screen. Then click the send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. All right, let's get started. Our first question is, Maureen, is there a genetic basis as to why some individuals would have acquired a less diverse microbiome? Or is this thought to be simply the current? Um, it is there are genetic effects on uh, on the microbiome that are known. Uh, there have been studies. In fact, there's a very interesting uh, twin study uh, being done by uh, my colleague Ruth Lay to look at the genetic effects on the gut microbiome. Uh, however, uh, in the case of MECFS, we, we don't know uh, much about, uh, you know, what effect the genetics might have on the this difference in the gut microbiome. Certainly, in the case of the uh, twins who have largely the same uh, genome. Uh, they have differences in the uh, gut microbiome, despite having been raised in the same household, been exposed to the same uh, microbes initially. My suspicion is that the reason it's different is the result of the uh, ill twins uh, alteration uh, resulting from uh, his, his uh, MECFS status. But it would be very interesting to uh, examine the genotypes further. Next question. Ruminous based microbe, I believe, is abundant in ruminants. Is a vegetarian diet better for MECFS management? I don't know much about uh, whether whether diet okay. We don't know whether diet is actually helpful uh, in MECFS. Patients anecdotally report that certain diets are helpful to them, but there really haven't been adequate studies to conclude whether a vegetarian or non-vegetarian diet is, is best for MECFS patients. Next question. Has there been any fecal transplant studies in MECSF patients? There have, okay. there have been uh, a, a, a few anecdotal reports or very small studies in which uh, individuals have had fecal transplants. And there's at least one report in a very small group uh, in which the patients reported uh, improvement after fecal transplants. But there haven't been large enough studies to conclude whether or not this would be helpful uh, with the symptoms. After publishing our microbiome study, I did have several individuals privately email me and say that they had had fecal transplants and that it had helped their symptoms. One individual, in fact, indicated that he'd had one and it helped for several years, but then he had relapsed and uh, uh, it was no, you know, he relapsed back to his earlier state. So we really don't know if that, uh, if fecal transplants would help. It is something that would be worth investigating. Next question. What are the exact orthostatic intolerance symptoms of MECSF? The uh, orthostatic intolerance symptoms are usually seen as uh, a problem when individuals are upright. Uh, they, uh, individuals seem to be unable to uh, control their autonomic nervous system properly. Uh, and this is actually one of the more disabling symptoms of uh, the disease. 
it, require, it results in some individuals having to be prone or at least reclining uh, for most of the day because they're unable to be upright. This has been also objectively demonstrated using a tilt table test uh, that many MECFS patients can have an objective uh, measurement of uh, POTS, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, uh, and other abnormalities upon uh, tilt table testing. So this, this is a very common symptom, and that's one reason that it's required either orthostatic intolerance or uh, cognitive difficulties. We're having some great questions coming in. Next question. Do you think the bacterial microbiome analysis result is the result or the cause of MECFS? Okay, I, I can only speculate since I have no evidence either way. But if I were to speculate, it would be my opinion that it's likely a consequence rather than a cause of the disease. However, I do think it, it is very likely a cause of some of the symptoms. I believe it could be exacerbating some of the uh, inflammatory symptoms that people experience, the, the flu-like feeling, uh, so, uh, some of the other uh, symptoms that uh, the patients report. So even though I doubt that it's the cause and I think it is a consequence, that doesn't mean that it wouldn't benefit the patients to have some help with the symptom. Uh, improvement in the gut microbiome could potentially improve some of the other symptoms. So because we don't have a treatment for the disease uh, that is applicable to all patients, uh, just like uh, the people with headache, sometimes headache medication makes them more comfortable. I think if we could uh, improve the gut microbiome, that could also uh, result in a benefit to the patients. Now, Maureen, this question refers to the twins that you spoke about in your presentation. Did they and do they currently live apart? And if so, would they have developed different gut microbiomes as a result? Uh, these twins are currently living apart and potentially some of the differences in their gut microbiomes could be due to the fact that they are living apart. And, uh, but um, the fact is that, that a lot of your gut microbiome is actually inherited from your mother. There have been a number of studies uh, showing that. Um, so it's, it's impossible to know since we don't have their gut microbiome uh, available from be before the, the, uh, one of them became ill. We can't know for sure. So some of the difference could be due to uh, they're living apart and having slightly different diets. On the other hand, the fact that the differences were very consistent with the differences we saw between the MECFS patients and the controls makes me suspect that it's likely that a lot of the differences are due to the health status of the ill twin. Next question, could the modulation of microbiome be a solution for the illness? Do you have any experience in that? Again.
Okay. Um, with regard, uh, with regard to um, improvement in uh, uh, MECFS microbiomes, we don't really know how to do that. There have been some reports, uh, again, uh, often uh, small reports of improvement when people took various um, interventions, probiotics, uh, and there have been anecdotal reports that they're helpful. But this is, again, something that needs to be studied. We really don't know exactly how to improve the microbiome uh, of these individuals, whether one might improve it with diet, uh, probiotics, fecal transplants, any of those things uh, are worth studying to find out if we could improve the gut microbiome of the patients. Okay, Maureen, this is a two-part question. First question, were the healthy individuals who reported to have abdominal pain included as controls in the study? And was there a difference in the gut microbiome between these individuals and the other healthy individuals? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, just like uh, the, uh, the fact that uh, we needed to go back and analyze the, uh, the patients who had worse uh, intestinal symptoms than, the, uh, than others, we actually haven't gone back to analyze whether the small number of healthy individuals who reported their, that they had some in, uh, intestinal discomfort we actually haven't done that, and it is something that would be interesting to do to see if they uh, have worse, um, uh, uh, you know, un more unusual uh, microbiomes than the uh, other healthy individuals. That would be interesting to do, but we actually have not done that analysis. Uh, we did include, we didn't discriminate against the uh, individuals uh, who, who were otherwise healthy, but reported that they had some sort of abdominal discomfort, not necessarily um, uh, not necessarily pain. Some of these individuals may have reported that they had diarrhea or constipation frequently. So um, uh, we didn't, we, we, given that we had a fairly small cohort, we, we didn't eliminate those individuals from the analysis. Okay, we have time for one more question. Let's see. Maureen, were the CFS patients taking medications and or supplements which might account for the differences in their microbiome compared to controls? Uh, we did uh, survey the patients and controls before incorporating them into our study. The uh, patients and controls were uh, excluded if they had taken antibiotics within uh, uh, three months of the um, uh, of collection of the fecal samples. It was really not feasible to uh, exclude individuals who might have been taking some supplements uh, uh, we did, we did, uh, you know, question them about their supplements. But one issue about uh, controlling for supplements is that, for example, we don't know if some of them, you know, ate more yogurt than others, or so. It's very hard to to restrict, the, you know, to to restrict on the basis of diet or supplements. But anything uh, extreme, like uh, heavy doses of uh, probiotics or uh, uh, antibiotics, we would not want to, we wouldn't include them in the study. I would like to once again thank Maureen Hansen for her presentation. Maureen, do you have any final comments for us? Mm -hmm. talk was informative. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, 
I hope my talk was informative and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to explain our work and also uh, let people know about the seriousness of the disease known as MECFS. Thank you once again, Maureen. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing until December 8, 2016. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.